good to see everyone this morning. We're glad you're here. I hope you brought a Bible. I'd like for you to turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. While you're turning there, um, Matthew 16, you know, our sister's uh, dream uh, that she shared this morning. It's interesting. I had just read uh, some statistics about what what pastors can expect in the upcoming year. Um, and one of the things it said you could expect is that uh, church attendance generally overall continues to decline in the United States. Um, and it's one of the things that pollsters say is vastly underreported. In fact, this said less than one person in 20 in America now attends church at all. Uh, less than one in 20. Another thing they, they said you could expect is that uh, Americans in general just find the church, uh, it, it has no value to them. You know, it, it doesn't really do anything for them. Uh, I guess you'd say, and, uh, and one of the more alarming trends is that even people who are regular churchgoers, regular churchgoers now attend less often, so that the people who are regular, nowadays you're considered a regular attender if you show up once a month, um, right? And that, they, they claim, is a continuing trend in the United States. They expect that uh, to probably uh, accelerate, you know, the fewer people attending church. They attribute it to many things, but surprisingly, one of the main uh, things they attribute it to is affluence. That uh, the more affluent Americans become, uh, the more ways we have to spend our money and, yeah. you know, and the... Uh, Church just becomes, being a part of the church just becomes less important. And, uh, you know, kids' activities, they've got, as the world becomes more secular, less Christian, more and more activities are scheduled on Sundays, school activities, ball games, this activity, that activity, so people get more and more involved in, in that sort of thing. And then, uh, you know, we've got the increase in single-parent homes. That actually contributes to... Uh, the, I guess, a, 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 a lower uh, rate of attendance and general neglect or spiritual apathy uh, really, I think, is the culprit. Now, sometimes people don't attend because they can't. They work. Uh, you know, sometimes people are just not able to attend. Sometimes they going through physical things or trials. You, you, know what, you know what blesses me is when I hear people like Brother Eddie, when, uh, you know, unfortunately they're not here today, but uh, when he tells me, you know, Brother Rusty, this is the highlight of our week. When we get, when we get to go to church, he said, that's the highlight of our week. We look forward to it all week. And it's such a disappointment when they don't get to come. Um, I do believe that uh, as we move closer towards the end, that we will see an increasing apathy. Uh, remember the, the Lord rebuked the church that lost its first love, uh, and the first love is always our love for the Lord, you know, above everything else and above all else. Amen. But it's interesting that uh, this, this all came out today just because I, uh, I had Matthew 16 as my text for today, where the Lord said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. So that no matter what assails, no matter what comes, God still has a people. He still has a people. And even all the conspiracies, forces, armies uh, of hell will not overcome it. So, I hope you have a Bible. Mark 16 is our text. I want to look at this passage, and I want to look at it in its immediate context. Mark 16, uh, I, I mean Matthew 16. I want to emphasize today to us the importance of the
the church, the, the Lord's church, the church that he said he would build. So in Matthew 16 <laughs> and verse 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and on this rock, or upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I, I want to focus on these verses today and, uh, and see, I believe we will see an emphasis here that, uh, that is not only significant, it's, it's vastly important. Let's remember the, the general context here. The Lord has been working many miracles. You know, this, you read Matthew 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, all the way up to this point. He's been doing astounding miracles. Uh, no, no one had ever seen anything like it. In fact, the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, the mute would speak. No one had ever seen anything like this. Uh, demons were cast out. People were made well. People who had been sick and lame and, and so forth. Uh, he multiplied food. He calmed the seas. He walked on water. He raised the dead. Now, People had just not seen things like this, not since the days of Elijah and Elisha. And then, of course, there were his teachings that uh, were so profound, so powerful, so moving. People, people had never been stirred in their hearts like this before. It wasn't anything like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. You imagine hearing Jesus talk. Imagine how your soul would be stirred down to the very depth uh, of your being. Imagine how convicted you would be. Imagine how persuaded uh, you would be by what he said. Amen. So n no one had ever seen or heard anything like this before, ever. Some of the old prophets now, Elijah and Elisha, you know, they had some profound miracle ministries uh, but nothing compared to what Jesus did and did repeatedly. None of them walked on water. This was unprecedented. What he did was unparalleled. And, and he got them together, and in verse 13, he asked his disciples this question. He asked them, saying, Who do men, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He wanted their... He wanted to know what was the opinion of the people. What is the consensus? What are the people saying about me? Who do they say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist that uh, resurrected. Some say you're the prophet Elijah. Come back. Some say you're Jeremiah, the prophet. Come back. Even though, you know, interestingly that they would mention Jeremiah because Jeremiah didn't do miracles. But Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And Jesus is referred to as the man of sorrows. Uh, so maybe they saw some correlation there. Uh, but Elijah certainly worked miracles, uh, as did Elisha. But they were mystified. They had all kinds of opinions. It's always a dangerous thing when you ask for people's opinions, you know. <laughs> because you never know what you're going to get. So many opinions. All agreed on this one thing. All the people, you know, when they say, who, who do the people say? He said, they said, this prophet, that prophet, 
all agreed on this. There's somebody extraordinary. No ordinary person here, right? But the Lord wasn't really interested in what other people thought. Uh, he already knew what the scribes thought of him, the Pharisees thought of him, the Sadducees. He already knew that. Uh, he came to the point here when he said in verse 11, but who do you say, who do you say that I am? That's a, now that's an important question. Who do you say? This is what mattered because what this does is it comes down to the test of their personal faith. Who do you say? You personally, what do you say? By the way, this is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. The synoptics, if you remember, are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're the ones that carry the gospel accounts of Christ. Synoptic means to see together. They all say, you know, essentially the same thing, cover the same ground, whereas John is altogether a different gospel. His is much more theological. John goes all the way back to eternity past. In the beginning was the word and so forth. But all three of the gospels record this question, so, so it's a very important question, but then again, so is the answer. And notice who it was who was first to respond, verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Greek, the Christos, the Christos. It means the Messiah. Uh, it means the Christ. In fact, this word Christos appears 569 times in the New Testament. 569 times, every single time, it's translated Christ. Except for the few places where it's translated Christ's. Not in the plural, because there's not plural Christ's, but in the possessive, you know, like as belonging to Christ. We are fools for Christ's sake. Amen. You know, for his sake. Or uh, you are Christ's and Christ is God's, or Galatians 5.24. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh uh, with its affections and lusts. Not, not the plural, because there's no plural Christ, but the possessive, those who belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. That's important, by the way, that the word Christos is always translated Christ. It's important because there are some characters out there on TV who have very powerful ministries who claim that we are also Christ's because Christ was the anointed one and, they, and now we're the anointed ones. So we're Christ's as well. Uh, and I, I was in a meeting years ago, pastor's meeting, probably a thousand people there, uh, half of which were pastors and the other half were their wives, I guess. And they had a guest speaker who got up and taught on that very thing, mm -hmm. that just as Christ is the anointed one, so we are the anointed ones, we are Christ's also. We are little Christ's. And the guy got a standing ovation. Oh. It was all I could do to, to, to stay in my seat, to be honest with you. And uh, it was actually the most blasphemous message I've ever heard in my life because it made, it made men into little deities. Uh, I'll never forget a year or so later, uh, I was at a restaurant with Diane and a pastor from out in New Orleans East. Now, this was before the hurricane, but... Uh, Pastor Charles Green saw us over there, and he came up to us and talked to us at the table, you know. And, uh, or maybe it was the other way around. I think I went and talked to him and his wife at his table, just how y'all doing and so forth, you know. But anyway, he said, hey, I got a guest speaker coming to the church. You're going to really be interested in this fellow. Right. And uh, he said, you're going you're gonna to want to come come hear him, you know. I, I said, oh, yeah, who you got coming? He said, Creflo Dollar. He said, have you ever heard of him? I said, I have. 
He said, I'm surprised. He said, because not everybody ha has heard of him. I said, I've heard of him. I said, I actually heard him in person one time. Yeah. And he said, oh, okay, well, what did you think? Well, he shouldn't ask me that. <laughs> but, and, and, because I wouldn't have told him if he hadn't asked me. But because he asked me, I said, well, I'll be honest. I, he preached the most blasphemous message I ever heard in my life. And his face kind of, yeah, kind of got pale a little bit. And he, he, uh, he said, well, went on talking to his wife, I guess. Our conversation was over anyway. But uh, there is one Christ, not many Christs. There are many false Christs. But only one real Christ. And here's what, and that Christ is the Messiah, the Messiah that the Jews were looking for, uh, awaiting. They were waiting, awaiting the Messiah. He is the one, the Christ, the chosen one, the anointed one, and the unique one. And let's notice that because here's what Peter says Thou art. The Christ, the Christ, the definite article is there. The Christ, right. not just not another Christ, a Christ. No, thou art, you are the Messiah, the Christ. Notice, the Son of the living God. The Son. Amen. Again, not a son, not a child of God. The Son of the living God. Christ is unique in all the world, in all the universe, He is the, the Son, the eternal S-O-N, Son, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, so long awaited, so long anticipated, the one that the Bible said the government would be upon His shoulders and His name would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's who you are. You are that one, the one that it is said of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Uh, he's the one who would be born of the virgin, born of the virgin, that that's name would be Emmanuel. We know who you are, Lord. Others may be of divided opinion. Others may say you're this prophet, that prophet, this one or that one. But we know who you are. Thou art the Christ. And, and let's understand that when P, although Peter was the spokesman here, I don't believe he was speaking on his own. Uh, I believe that this was a matter. I don't see how it could not have been a matter that they hadn't already discussed amongst themselves quite a bit. They were his followers, right? So when he said, who do you say that I am? They had already talked about this. We know who you are. Amen. We, there's no doubt in our mind. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Son of the living God. And then in verse 17, the Lord says something to Peter, but by extension, we have to know that this applies to us all because of, of the revelation that it contains when he says, He said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You are blessed. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because what you have said, what you have declared, what you have come to realize or know was not deduced by any human rationale. This isn't something you just figured out on your own. This wasn't something uh, somebody else told you. In fact, he says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Y'all see verse 17? What revealed it to him? My Father, which is in heaven, revealed this to you. God the Father opened their eyes. God the Father open their understanding. Amen. Isn't it interesting also that the Lord called him here by his Hebrew name. He called him Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar meaning son or son of Jonah for Jonah or Jonas. 
Thou art Simon, son of Jonah. His Hebrew name. Simon, son of Jonah. Jonah, uh, a Hebrew name that means gracious. It means dove. Uh, he said, this is who you are, referring to his human, you know, his human father, his human parentage, his earthly father, uh, who was a fisherman. Peter's dad was a fisherman. But the knowledge you have here, this revelation you have received, did not come from your father. It came from my father. That's what he says. Simon bar Jonah, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Flesh and blood, his heritage, his Jewishness, his own parents, his own learning, education, Jewish upbringing, whatever it was, he said, no, my father revealed this to you. My father. And here's what's important for us to recognize today. If, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you sit here a believer today, it's because God has opened your eyes. Thank you, Lord. He has opened your eyes. Yeah. He has opened your heart to understand, yeah. to believe, to receive. And, and, and this is... This is a very important thing for us to grasp right here, and that is that salvation is by revelation of the Son of God. Salvation is by revelation of the Son of God, a revelation of who He is and what He did. Salvation is Christ when Christ is fully revealed to our heart then we recognize my good works doesn't save me. My good intentions doesn't save me. All the deeds that I do to serve people doesn't save me and can't save me. Amen. Only Christ can save me. Right. Only Christ can save me because only he died on a cross for our sins. Right. Our denomination can't save us. Our religious affiliation can't save us. Our Masonic Lodge can't save us. Nothing but Christ can save us. Amen. Salvation is by revelation of the Son of God. Amen. That He is Lord, that He is God, that He's the one who, who died on the cross for us. And you know what? Salvation doesn't come any other way. Amen. When we pray for our loved ones, that, that's how we have to pray, that God would open their understanding, open their hearts, give them sight. Amen. Because it doesn't come by arguing somebody into it. It comes by divine revelation of the Son. Let me just give you a couple of quick verses. 1 John 5, 1, listen to this. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. You believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Christos, the Savior, the Deliverer. If you believe it, then your life has changed. You are not the same person that you once were. 1 John 5, 11, This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. It's in the Son. Life is in the Son. Salvation is by revelation of the Son. This life is in His Son. That means there's life no other way, no other Venue, no other avenue, salvation is not in anyone else. Amen. It's only in the Son. First John five twelve. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Amen. It's important that we have the Son dwelling in our heart, right? right. He says. Verse 13, 1 John 5, 13, These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That you can know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13, you can know it. How can you know it? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is, what He did. Amen. And then 1 John 2 and verse 23 says this, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Deny the Son, you don't have the Father either. 
But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. There's no access to the Father apart from the Son. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. You're not coming in any other way. I am the way, the one way, the exclusive way. Christianity is very exclusive. We can go to God only through the Son. And on the other hand, it's very inclusive. It includes all who will believe. All, any race, any color of skin, any nationality, any background, no matter what you've been, what you've done, it's very inclusive. Christ will receive you if you will believe, if you will call upon him. But all salvation is by revelation of the Son. You must believe in the Son to be saved. That is, you must believe who he is and what he did. Because you're not saved apart from that. Now, it's important that we establish this. I'm going somewhere with this. Because to understand verse 18, we really have to get a hold of verse 17. Because when he gets to verse 18, he says, And I say unto you, Peter, I say also unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock... I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, now here we see some more interesting things. First, in this verse, the Lord calls him Peter. Petrus. But he just called him Simon Barjona in the previous verse, right? Simon Barjona... Here he calls him Peter. The Greek word means a stone. That's what it means, a stone. Uh, That is very clearly evident in passages like John 1.42. I'm going to take a minute and read this verse. I want you to listen to it. John 1.42. This is where Andrew brought his brother Simon to Jesus because he, he came running to him. He said, we have found the Messiah. So in John 142, he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, 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 which is by interpretation a stone. John 142, Thou art Cephas, which is the Chaldee, the Syriac, thou art Kephas, which means a stone, which is by translation a stone. And guess what the word stone is there? Petrus, Peter. You are Kephas, which means Peter, a rock. You are a rock. He is not the rock, but he is, Peter would be called a rock, as opposed to Simon the son of a dove, he is Petrus, a rock. You can't detach verse 18 from verse 17 because in verse 17, remember, he told Peter, you know, speaking to him, I think, as the head of the group, just saying, Peter, you've received a great revelation, a revelation from my father. Now I'm going to give you another revelation. And that revelation is right here on, in verse 18, on this rock. The Greek word here, Petra, I will build my church. On this rock, Petra. The Petrus, Peter, and the Petra, two different things. Petra means a boulder, a cliff, a some gigantic chunk of rock, like the rock of Gibraltar or something like that. Uh, the, the church would not be built on a stone. It would be built on a rock. Uh, he said, on this rock, I'll build my church. Uh, the church would be founded on the rock, the Petra. I hope you all are following me. The revelation of the Son. That's what it would be built on. The revelation of the Son. Salvation is by revelation in the Son. Salvation is not 
the revelation, based on the revelation of Peter, but on the revelation of the Son of God. Look, John 1.42, I just mentioned this verse. Peter, Kephas, means a stone, right? Petra, on this rock, verse 18, I'll build my church. Uh, I, I, let, me, let me tell you, let me just show you how the difference stands out. Matthew 7, you don't have to turn there, but listen to this. Matthew 7, 24. The Lord said, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The Greek word there, Petra. He will, a, a wise man builds his house upon a rock. Not on a stone, not on a Petrus, but on a rock. He's talking about on a cliff, upon something big, huge, firm, immovable. If you're wise, you won't build on sand. And it would be impossible to build a house on a stone. But you can build a house on a rock, a Petra. Y'all with me so far? And, and then he goes on, he says, the rains descend, and the floods come, the winds blow, and they beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a Petra, a Petra, a rock. Now, I believe the Lord is wise. He would not build his house upon a stone, not on a Petrus which was Peter's name, Petrus. But he would build his house upon a rock, a Petra. Amen. The Lord is a wise builder, right? Yes. He would build his church on the revelation of himself. Amen. Because our God is a rock. That's what the Bible says. Right. Uh, for who is God save the Lord? Who is a rock except for our God, Psalm says. So in verse 18, the Lord said he would build his church, his church, and the church wouldn't be a building because the word church itself, Matthew 16, 18, the word church itself is the word congregation or assembly. It's the Greek word ekklesia. They are the assembly that God has called out for himself. And he said, I will build my church, my assembly, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The armies of hell, all the conspiracies and plans and schemes of hell. Uh, and, and this is a revelation itself that the Lord would build his church. I will build my church my ecclesia, my assembly, my congregation, my people. I will build a people for myself, uh, my church. It'll be mine. You know, all kinds of organizations have assemblies. Uh, you can't go down the street without seeing a Lions Club building, Kiwanis Club, uh, Masonic Temple. There's all kinds of golf clubs. Well, all kinds of assemblies everywhere. Governments have their assemblies and their gatherings and their meetings. All the idolatrous religions have theirs and so forth. But here's what the Lord said. I'm going to build my own assembly. Right. I will build my assembly. It'll be mine. It'll belong to him. It'll belong exclusively to him. It won't belong to any man. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to no man. It belongs to... No, no matter how important or dignified or educated that man is, or group of men, the church is the Lord's. The church belongs to the Lord. The true church of the Lord Jesus Christ is his church. It's his. It will, that means it will exist for his purposes. It will exist for his glory. It will exist for the advancement of his kingdom. It doesn't exist for the advancement of any man or, or, or any person's you know, personal ambition or their desire to build a personal empire. It exists for the Lord's purposes. That means it will proclaim his teachings. It will follow his message, his example. Y'all awake? Yes. 
it will follow his instructions. That's what the church is supposed to do. It follows the one to whom it belongs. It means they would adhere to his teachings. It means they would promote him. They would promote Christ. They don't exist to promote themselves. They don't exist to promote an agenda. They exist to promote the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't exist to promote his mother. They don't exist to promote the saints. We praise God for godly examples, but the church is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It focuses on Christ. It centers around Christ. Its worship focuses on Christ. It would also be separate and exclusive of all other assemblies. He says, I'm going to build my assembly. That means it's mine, my people, my church, my congregation. So it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ exclusively. It's not the church of Christ and physical fitness or the church of Christ and the Republican Party or not the church of Christ and coffee shop, uh, you know. (laughs) And when we talk about the saints, it's not the football team. It's the church of Christ and the gathering of the saints, which, hey, that's what you are. That's That's what the Bible says we are anyway. So all the church does is supposed to revolve around Christ, its head. Right? Now, Let's consider if the Lord said he was going to build his church. Now, this is a revelation he's giving here in, in, Revel, in uh, Matthew 16. If he says he's going to build his church on the earth, then I would think that's important. Amen. I would think it's important that the Lord didn't do unimportant or insignificant things, right? Yeah. He established one thing, that is, he established his church. He provided for it. Uh, I would think it should be important to us, too. Uh, When he tells the church, Acts 20, 28, feed the church of God that he's purchased with his own blood. Feed the church that he's purchased with his own blood. I I would say it was of extreme importance and uh, extremely valuable Lord well, says we're bought with a price, uh, the blood of God. So, so here's a question. Should we be nonchalant about being part of the church? Uh, as our sisters dream this morning and as uh, some of those statistics that I mentioned earlier we should not be among those who fail to participate or support or pray for or attend or help, you know, volunteer, serve, encourage. We should not be among those who fail in those areas. We should know better. The church that is so important to Christ has to be important to us. And, you know, of, of course, the Lord has assemblies all over the world people who love him and serve him in every corner of the world. I doubt that there's a nation on earth that doesn't have a church, even if it meets in secret, sometimes a handful of people meeting in a house, hiding in a barn. Uh, If it's the assembly of the saints, then it's God's church. It doesn't have to meet in a, a big tabernacle, temple, building it could meet in a home they could meet in a barn they could meet in a cave they could meet wherever it could be a handful of people it could be a thousand people or or even more but when they meet to exalt christ to glorify christ to serve christ to honor christ to teach christ to be instructed in the way of christ the word of christ when it revolves around christ that's his people when they have no personal agenda, when they're not 
exalting their own organization. When they don't claim exclusivity in the sense that the only way to heaven is through our organization, then you're in the wrong place, you know. But because the only way to heaven is through Christ, not not through any denomination or organization. But what's so important to the Lord, I believe, should be important to us and should therefore not be neglected by us, right? And in a day, in a time of what the world is noticing as a trend of declining church attendance, let's remember the Lord's words through the writer to the Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let's consider one another to provoke into good works, into love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more, exhorting one another, so much the more as we see the day approaching. Uh, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Don't forsake that. Don't consider it insignificant or unimportant or, or not meaningful to you. It, I find it interesting. Hebrews 10.25, all the way back in the first century, they were already having people who just weren't attending the church as they should. Not, they were neglecting the church. He said, don't be like the manner of some. Already in the first century it was happening. It's, and of course, it, it continues to happen, right? Yeah. One version translates it, we must not quit meeting together as some are doing. Another says, some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, one version says, we should not stop gathering together with, with other believers as some of you are doing. Stop doing that. Well, I had also read this uh, past week that I don't know where they get some of these numbers from, but 3,500 people a day, they claim, just give up on going to church, 3,500 day, a day. So it's an increasing trend. Look, you can offer all kinds of excuses why you don't. I'm tired. Uh, I had, you know, we've got lots of excuses. We, we're good at excuses. Uh, I'm, I'm bored. You know, I'm just bored. I don't like the music. I don't like. The people, I don't like the preacher, whatever, it's too loud, it's too long, it's whatever. I'm offended by so-and-so, I've been hurt, you know, I've just been hurt by this, so I just don't go back because I've been hurt. Yep. But, you know, people get hurt in cars and they get back in them. Very true. <clears throat> yeah. We all know people who've been hurt, probably perhaps even killed in automobiles, but we get right back in them, don't we? Don't, don't stop us. Yeah. That's right. You've probably been hurt at work but you still go. Well, you know, I just don't, I just don't feel, I just don't feel like, I mean, I don't feel like I fit in. I don't feel like I belong here. Well, probably Jesus didn't feel like dying on a cross. He probably didn't feel like it, and he probably didn't feel like he belonged there either. Probably felt like you belonged there. <laughs> And I belong there. Right. But, Thank you, Lord. but he died in our stead. Paid a terrific price for the church. For a privilege that I pray that we will all value. I pray that we will value each other. I do believe that the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ will defy the trends of the world. And that God's people will continue to gather together and that they will value one another's fellowship uh, and prayers and recognize just how important it is to be a part of an assembly. Something, something has happened in our modern world where people just kind of withdraw and become recluses behind a you know, a computer screen or a telephone. And it's real easy to withdraw from uh, the social setting. But, you know, the church is social. Social in that it forces us to gather. Uh, 
It, we are compelled to gather. And if you have the heart of a believer, you want to gather. You want to. There's something that draws you to do it. And that, despite the fact that you have to get out of a warm bed on a cold day <laughs> and drive and, you know, go through maybe sitting next to somebody that, that guy aggravated me last week. And... uh but, you know, all of that is, is part of growing. It, right. It's overcoming, forgiving, loving, right. praying. Everybody comes in with situations and issues, and yes. we're all going through things. So you, love, you learn to overlook. You learn to love. You learn to forgive. You learn to let the sharp, you know, iron sharpens iron. You let a brother rub up against you a little bit in the sense that, you know, maybe your fur needs to be rubbed the wrong way. Maybe that way you'll die a little bit more to the flesh, you know. <laughs> and this is what he promises. The very gates of hell will not prevail against it. It won't prevail against the church, not even the assaults of hell itself. The gates of a city always rep represented the strength. Uh, you know, cities in the ancient times were walled. They had walls to keep the marauders, the invaders, uh, all that out. And the gates had to be powerful. They had to be strong because, you know, they always consider that's where they want to come through. They want to come through the gates. Also, there were a place where business was conducted. Government was conducted in the gates of the city. So the gates represented the, you know, the very thing itself. So when the Bible speaks of the gates of hell, it's talking about all the forces, the government, the schemes of hell itself will not prevail against the church. However, what is implied in that passage is that the church and all who comprise it would be the target of the gates of hell. Yep. That they would be the target. Well, the devil's already got the people in the world. Right. He's already got them. True. So what he targets, what he wants to do is undermine the believers undermine them, uh, divide and conquer, separate them. And, you know, hell through the centuries has stirred up every kind of evil strategy. Hell has fought the church for centuries. Persecution, slander, distortions, false doctrines, false brethren, vilifying mockery, and it still does when when. When open, outright assault fails, then the devil joins the church and uh, right. tries to get it sidetracked, chasing rabbits or getting involved in everything but what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, I believe there are a lot of good causes in the world. I don't disdain all political activism, but I believe it's a snare for the church to get involved because that's a distraction. It's a distraction from our purpose. We're here to preach Christ, teach Christ, follow Christ, instruct others to live for Christ, to pray. But I do believe that it all leads eventually to a, a great falling away, uh, an apathy that the Lord said in the last days, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold. But here's the promise that the very forces of hell itself, though they be joined together, all of hell joined together, they will not prevail against the Lord's church. They will not prevail. I want to read one thing, and, and, and then we're going to quit. But listen to this. This is a footnote in my Bible. It's so good, I want to read it. It says, The gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell represent Satan and all the evil in the world striving to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. This passage does not mean that any particular believer, local church, fellowship of churches, or denomination will never fall into immorality, doctrinal error, or apostasy. Jesus himself predicted that many will fall from the faith, and he warns churches that are abandoning the New Testament faith to turn from their sins or face removal from his kingdom. The promise of verse 18 
does not apply to those who deny the faith or to lukewarm churches. That's right. A lukewarm church, ones that aren't founded on the Word of God, they are going to fall away. They are going to be crushed by the devil in the last days. But the gates of hell won't prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says what Christ means is that in spite of Satan doing his worst, apostasy occurring among believers, churches becoming lukewarm, and false teachers infiltrating God's kingdom, the church will not be destroyed. By his sovereign grace, wisdom, and power, God will always have a remnant of believers and churches throughout redemptive history who will remain faithful to the original gospel of Christ and the apostles and who experience his fellowship, the lordship of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. As God's true people, they will demonstrate the kingdom power of the Holy Spirit against Satan, sin, disease, the world, and the demonic. It is this church that Satan and all his hosts cannot destroy or resist. I do believe that the Lord's church will persevere, the Lord's people will persevere, and that we have to buck this trend of uh, apathy and falling away and just come to appreciate and to prize more and more the opportunity to fellowship with brothers and sisters of like precious faith. I know, I know I appreciate it when people tell me they're praying for me. I believe I need this church as, as much as anybody. I need the fellowship. I need the edification, the encouragement. I, I need your company. Uh, and you need ours. We need one another's. You know when the Bible says, if they're sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. You know what's implied there? You belong to the church. That there's a church where you've got elders you, have a, you can call and say, hey, pray for me. And also, those elders, those church leaders need the body. How often did Paul the Apostle say, y'all pray for us. Pray, pray. We, you know what? We need each other's prayers. We need each other's encouragement, each other's edification. So do not neglect do not neglect something so precious. And let's ask the Lord together to help us to prize what he prizes. Uh, the assembly. He said, I'll build my church. We want to be a part of that. Amen. Father, we pray today that we would be a part, a, a very part, an assembly Lord, that exists to honor and glorify and exalt the Savior. Lord, deliver us from our own ambitions and agendas. Lord, let us exist for one purpose, and that be Christ's. Help us, Lord Jesus, to fulfill the calling, the purpose that you have for your church. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, all who comprise this body, all who attend. Lord, let us be taught, be instructed, be edified here. Lord, let us always be pointed to you here. Help us, Lord Jesus, each and every one of us, to resist the temptations of this world to draw us away or to draw us aside. Help us to resist the apathy, the indifference, the neglect. Help us, Lord Jesus, to not be numbered among those who have forsaken the assembling of themselves together. But so much the more as we see the day approaching, help us, Lord, to appreciate the church that you died for and purchased with your own blood. We Pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. amen. And amen. Praise God. Um.